Well, Children's Church is dismissed. If you have kids from three years old to kindergarten, uh, we would love to have them uh, participate in Children's Church. Um, it is out the back and then to the right here. And I think there's also some space in nursery if you're interested in that and as well. My name is Peter Sontag. I'm uh, the pastor for Youth and Adult Discipleship here at Highland. Uh, we have a lot of newcomers in the last few weeks, and I just wanted to say welcome. Thank you for um, visiting and, and coming to worship with us today. Um, my journey here is, you know, we've been here for about over a year, and I just wanted to share a, a story that has a little bit intro into our message today. So we... You know, we moved here about a year ago, and we were about, you know, here for a few months, and we were making friends, and we were starting, but we were just waiting for that kind of that deep connection type of moment. So there was a, there was a time I was with the youth group, and we, you know, the youth event was over, and we were, we were eating cheap food, you know, youth group food, you know, beans, hot dogs, and so me and this volunteer, this guy, you know, we're, we're friends at this time, but we're, we're kind of cleaning up and kind of munching, kind of chatting. And so kind of as we ate, we just got more and more into kind of bro-ness and, and started taking hot dogs and dipping them into baked beans and eating them. And slowly but surely, you know, at one point in time, one of us crossed the line where we weren't just doing one dip, but we were doing what they call the double dip. And, and I, I realized it, and I, I kind of met eyes with them, and I'm like, this is a moment here. I have a moment in this relationship. We can either, we can either I can get grossed out, or I can kind of acknowledge this, embrace it, and I kind of talk to them. I'm like, hey, you know what we're doing? And we kind of just kept still double dipping. And, and then I knew I was in with this guy, that we, we had reached a new level in our friendship. And so today, that's kind of what we're talking about is how... How does the church grow into deep relationships? And what does it mean to have deep relationships with one another? So we are going to be in Acts chapter 2 uh, today and then Acts chapter 4. So if you want to have a Bible or pull it up on your phone, I'll be hopping back in between those. But we're going to start in Acts chapter 2, verses 42 through 47. And then the passage in Acts chapter 4 is... 32 through 37. So I'm going to read uh, 42 and through 47 to start our time here today. Uh, this is talking about the early church. And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers. And awe came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. And all who believed were together and had all things in common. They were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. And day by day, attending the temple together, breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God, having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number day by day, those who were being saved. So these, these two descriptions of community in the book of Acts kind of follow two speeches in the book of Acts. One is after Peter on the day of Pentecost, and he's speaking to everyone who's gathered for this Jewish festival. The second one is after Peter. Um, him and John, Peter and John, um, they have a healing in the temple, and they are dragged between, in front of the men and the council that crucified the Lord Jesus Christ. So um, Peter speaks mainly in both of those, and then the second one, you know, John's the wingman. If you've ever been a wingman in any situation, the Bible doesn't condemn it. It's good to have a wingman. It's good to be there to kind of just you know, be there for your buddy and drive home his points. So we, we come to these descriptions after uh, these, these two speeches, and it talks about what is their fellowship like, what is their community like. And Acts chapter 4, verse 33, gives just a little bit more detail 
on this. Um, and it talks about what the apostles' teaching is like. So, and great power, and with great power, the apostles were giving their testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace came upon them all. So we can see that the community devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, and part of this teaching was their testimony of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. Now, this, the resurrection of Jesus is the, the bedrock of our faith. It is the event that God decisively has shown that he has saved us. Um, and he does so as a historical act. So this is Jesus really rose from the dead. There, in space, in time, there were real eyewitnesses. Um, and with any kind of historical event, you can, you can prove it because of its effects. If this is the cause. The resurrection is the cause. There's certain effects that come after that. So there's reasons in the Bible that show that Jesus is truly risen from the dead, and there's reasons outside the Bible as a historical event of why he is risen from the dead. Why is that true? So we won't dive in those today, but that is the bedrock of our faith. The second thing about the resurrection of the Lord Jesus and that the passage in 33 uh, brings up is that it is a great grace. So the early church didn't deserve this grace. And today, we don't deserve this grace. Uh, we don't deserve to have Christ rise for us. We deserve to pay the price for our sins against an eternal God. And what is the price? The price for sinning against eternal God is receiving an eternal conscious punishment against an eternal God. But God is rich in grace. He's rich in grace, giving us what we don't deserve. And he takes on our punishment on the cross. And then he rises from the grave so that through faith in Christ, we who believe can participate in this eternal, resurrected life with Christ. And we have it, for those who believe, we have it now, and as when he comes again, it will be expressed fully. So the apostles' teaching and their testimonies about this resurrection brought transformation to the church. I mean, Peter was, was just such a wimp. He was such a wimp. There was a young girl when the night Jesus was on trial, who was asking him, do you know Jesus? And he just chickens out. But now him and John are brought between the highest authority in the land, and they don't back down. What happened? Well, they were transformed by the Holy Spirit coming and dwelling in their hearts. And therefore, God used those men to give teaching, to strengthen the church and equip them for ministry. And we don't have to wonder, you know, what is in this teaching when it says, you know, what is this teaching of the apostles? We have the teaching of the apostles. They wrote it down for us. We have it contained in our New Testimony, our New Testament, so that we don't have to worry and wonder what were they teaching. We, we just have it. And if we want this type of power, of God's power that's shown throughout the book of Acts, we need to hold on to the words of the Holy Spirit. He's the one who writes Holy Scripture. Holy Scripture is his words. He carries men along when they speak in order to write Holy Scripture. And so we can't reject the words of the Bible but want God's power. It'd be like saying to someone, I really want you to do something for me, and I really want you to work for me, but I don't want to talk to you, and I for sure don't want to listen to you. It's not going to work out, and that's going to be a bad relationship. That person isn't going to be very inclined to really do anything for you. And if we want God to work and show up in powerful ways, we need to be attentive to his word. So with that, um, we see that the early church devoted themselves to the teachings of the apostles. Now, they... They were devoted to something else in verse 42. It comes up as the fellowship. Now, I've written in your bulletin, I've written 
the word community like six or seven times. And the word community, we use it today. It's a very common word. Um, we especially use it in this area to talk about people who are in our towns or people who are neighbors who are around us. And it makes sense because we're kind of out in this, we're in this open space and there's not like one name of one area that kind of defines everyone here. So we just kind of say, you know, people in your community or the community. Um, that type of use of that word is not how I'm using it today, especially not how it's in your bulletin. The word community that I'm focusing on is the word here in Acts 42, which is koinonia. Now, it's a goofy Greek word, but it is so big and broad that it takes several English words to define it. Um, it comes out here as fellowship. It can come out in the New Testament as community. It also has ideas of partnership. Like you would be a partner at a business firm. You had a vested interest in it. That's what the gospel is. You have a partnership in the gospel. And lastly, it comes out in the New Testament as sharing with one another, that in the fellowship they share, that that's what's implied with this community. So you could define koinonia as um, being a deeply personal and committed and united group that shares in a mission. So what united? What is that? What unites them? What brings the group together? First uh, John uh, chapter 117 says, as we, if we walk in the light as he is in the light and have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. So it's Jesus that unites us. Jesus is in the light. When we come to Christ, we're not, we don't go to Jesus alone. There's people that God is drawing to himself that that verse says we need to be in fellowship with. And the beauty of this is God draws together people from all tongues, all tribes, all nations, and even people within um, the same type of area. He draws together people who don't really normally hang out together, people with different personalities or interests. A lot of times in your church, you might, you know, you might think, oh, what? I wouldn't, I wouldn't know this person normally if I didn't go to church with them. And that's because God draws together people who are different in order to show that only he can bring these people together. Only he can be their Lord. There's no one else who can bring the church together. Only, they can only come being united in Christ. Um, so if the transformed community is about being united to Christ and being united together, um, what else does it mean to have fellowship with one another? Well, Acts 43 uh, in chapter 2 says that all who believed were together and had all things in common. So it's not just about us being united to people personally, but it's also about the stuff we bring. It's about um, the stuff we own, the stuff that God gives us to share. Now, when you read that verse 30, um, uh, 43, it, it may first, at first glance, it may sound like the church is practicing a certain type of communism. But as you read on in Acts, that's not the case. No one is demanding that anyone give up personal property that that's outlawed. No, people are just so generous with the stuff that they have that they're able to share it with one another, that no one is in need. In uh, chapter 4, it says, Now the full number of those who believed were of one heart and soul. And that's the unity we're talking about. And no one said of any of the things that belonged to him was his own, but they had everything in common. So the Chapter 4 gives a picture of Ananias. He owns a field that's his possession. He decides what to do with it, but he decides to sell it and give it up for the people so that no one would be in need. And this, this fulfills what Paul the Apostle is talking about in 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 7, when he says, Each must give as he has decided in his heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion. 
There's our key word there. They're not compulsed. They give freely. For God loves a cheerful giver. And this just shows that because we just have all things in Christ, um, Christians can live life with open hands. And this same type of generosity, the same spirit, is here at this church, is here at Highland. For those of you, you've just been so generous and you've deeply desired to see God's mission advance both locally in this surrounding area and globally through our missions council. Um, so I'm excited to share a couple of things that the elders have given me to share. Um, and I just want you to see that unless the spirit of God is at work, this, this stuff doesn't happen. So first, um, I just wanted to share with you that after expenses, you know, this calendar year, the general budget is $32,000 over in net. So that's 32000 over net expenses. So that's just such a grace as we use that budget to fulfill our mission statement, to help people to know Christ, to grow in faith, and become engaged in ministry. And that like manages all of our Awana classes, our youth program, our Sunday morning worship. Um, it forms our discipleship groups, our community groups, our men's women's ministry, our women's ministry. And lastly, it allows us to give to missionaries who are overseas so the gospel can go forth. So that's the first thing I wanted to share with you. Uh, the second thing I'm even more blown away by, uh, and I just know that only God when he works, can be able to do this. So uh, through everyone's giving, your sacrifice, um, we've been able to reduce the mortgage on this building this year by over $100,000. And I'm just blown away by that, that God would move in people's hearts to reduce our debt in this building. And I mean, if... 2020 hasn't taught us anything that it's, it's so, such a blessing that we as a church have a building, have a place where we can meet and gather together, and we have freedom and able to operate it on ourselves. It's, it's a huge blessing. So it's, it's not a necessity, and we're, I'm just so thankful for that. So just as the church gathered together as one in one place, we gather here on uh, Sundays to worship the one who has called us together, uh, the Lord Jesus Christ. So I'm telling you this not so that you relax, to put your feet up and say, oh, I, you know, we're all good. No, no, I want, I want you guys to know that this is like, this is like an uppercut to Satan, that you can't, like, if, so, if someone just connected in the ring they wouldn't just go sit down and drink some lemonade. You know, you would throw the left hook. You know, I'm not much of a boxer, but you'd throw the next punch. You just keep going. And that's what I'm telling everyone here, that we need to keep going. Keep on evangelizing. Keep on making disciples. Keep on giving. Keep on sacrificing. Keep on loving one another. Um, I'm just so excited that God do, has done this, and I'm so excited for what more he will do. So, you know, I'm talking about, like, punching Satan in the mouth. It sounds a little abstract. But in this, in this passage, there is, there's just a super practical way that you can attack the kingdom of darkness. And it's something that you do every day. It's not adding anything new to your life. It's just transforming it. So what is that? Uh, if I, we find it in our first, um, our main verse for today, verse 42 in chapter 2. And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship to the breaking of bread. So a transformed community breaks bread together. The early church may have used this as an on-ramp for people, as a way of outreach. They may have, someone may have come and heard the apostles' teaching, heard about the resurrected Christ, and they might say, I don't know if that's real. I'm a little skeptical. Is this group anything different than anywhere else? And they might be invited into someone's home and break bread with Christians and see the power of the transformed community. 
And chapter 2, verses 47 says what happened. God added to their number day by day those who uh, were being saved. So this is super practical for today. Welcoming people into your homes. They did it back then. It's super easy to do right here today. Um, Rosaria Butterfield, she put out this wonderful book that I think has just is the best work on hospitality right now. Um, it's called The Gospel Comes with a, ho- with a House Key. And it talks about how a skeptical post-Christian world is able to see authentic community, Christian community, through inviting people in and practicing Christian hospitality. She says, Let God use your home, apartment, dorm room, front yard, or garden for the purpose of making strangers into neighbors and neighbors into the family of God. And she goes on in her book and talking about her mother and her stepfather and how they were both such adamant atheists. But as they grew older, she welcomed them into her home and they saw her Christian community break bread, eat meals together, and their walls just came down and both of them accepted Christ. Uh, And they were both moved from being very hostile to the gospel to receiving the Lord. So there there you have it. That's the wonderful practice of Christian hospitality. The beauty of it is everyone needs to eat. Everyone needs to eat meals. You need to welcome people. Why not just transform it, change it a little bit, welcome people into your home, help them to see the grace that you have in Christ. So we talked a little bit about what is it like to break bread with unbelievers? What happens when you break bread with believers? What is the effect of that? Well, our key passage here, Acts chapter 2, 42, says, They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers. So what's followed by the breaking of bread is the mention of prayers. So when you break bread with believers, walls come down. People are able to be honest with their sins, their struggles, what's going on in their life, and it moves towards prayer. You might be able to come in on a Sunday morning worship and put the fake mask on. Everything's great. Nothing's going bad. But when you are in people's homes with fellow believers and you're eating meals, the walls come down, you're able to share what's, what's really going on, and it helps you to open up towards prayer. So this, um, this happened recently in an elder meeting of ours. You know, we had a big agenda, you know, lots to do. Are we going to get it done in the amount of time that we need to get it done? And um, so, but the, someone brought, you know, a dessert. An elder's wife brought a dessert she made. And we all start eating it, and the walls start coming down. And we start moving together as one mind, one body, one soul. And we're able to share, share our sins, share things that we're struggling with, and lift one another up in prayer. And then the meeting started, and we just knocked it out of the park. Why? Because we broke bread together. We prayed together. We were honest with one another. Uh, and that is so pivotal in Christian community. The Bible talks about how the transformed community prays for one another. They've been so transformed by the blood of Christ, they can be honest about their sins and their struggles and even their deep wounds. James 5.16 says, Therefore confess your sins to one another and pray for one another so that you may be healed. There might be aches and pains that we have in each other's lives, um, because, because of sin, uh, because we have unconfessed sin. And we need the body to come around and pray for us. And we need to confess and be real and be honest with what we're struggling. And God might remove a certain pain that we have because of that. Other times, I mean, life, life is, is hard. A lot of the, the sufferings and pains that we feel isn't because of our own sin, but just living in a fallen world. I mean, life is, life is tough, um, no one gets out alive. It, it, it's, we need people to be able to come alongside us and pray for us. And Ephesians 6.18 talks about this. 
It says, praying at all times in the spirit with all prayer and supplication. To that end, keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints. So we need believers around us who will continually pray for us. When things are going bad, that they're there for us. They're there holding us up in prayer. And even when things are good, that they're praying for us, that we're on their monthly prayer list, that they constantly, we constantly come to their minds, that they pray that we would be a blessing to others, that we would be transformed into the image of Christ. So how are we going to do that at Highland? How are we going to experience this transformed community laid out for us in the book of Acts? So the vision of the pastors and the elders is that we realize this through our community groups. Our community groups are set up just after this passage. They're devoted to reading the word together. They're committed to each member of the group. They're committed to breaking bread together with all the people in the group. Um, And the group commits to lifting up one another in prayer. So Highland's a church of a great legacy, You know, there's a lot of people who probably experience that Acts 2 community just informally, without being in a formal group, because they've been here so long. But there's a lot of new people here, and we have a wonderful connection team. Uh, People who are out in the foyer, they are trying to connect with new people, conversations they have with them, they get passed on to me, and I give those people a call. And a lot of them want to be more connected. They want to experience the transformed community. But the problem is, is we don't have, uh, all of our groups are full right now, and we need more leaders to facilitate these community groups. So I'm asking some of you that God would work in your heart to step out of maybe a comfort zone that you would have, to be facilitating one of these groups in order that people who come in to hear the teaching of the apostles found in the scriptures, that they would come and hear that and be connected and experience this transformed community of the bodily. So I'm praying for that today. Um, I would love it if, if anyone feels led to that to come talk to me, or you can shoot me an email. My name is in the bulletin. And our aim in that as pastors and elders is, is what happens in Acts 47, that God would add to our number day by day those who are being saved. And it's, it's not for our glory, but it's for God's, knowing that he desires all people to come to him, all people to be saved, that he would be glorified as the Savior of the world. Let me pray for us. Uh, we're going to move into a time of communion. Um, and I ask the elders to come forward. Um, as, we, as I move in prayer. Uh, Father, we, we, uh, we lift up these things to you. We are, we are thankful that you have resurrected Christ from the dead, that we don't deserve his grace, that we don't deserve to be united to you, but that you sought us out, that you pursued us, that you gave us this gift of grace by dying for us and rising for us. Father, help us to um, move in the way you want us to move, to be connected as a body, and that we would honor one another by breaking bread with one another, praying for one another, that we would be a transformed community, that we would shine a light uh, to this area, that people would be attracted to Christ and hear the gospel of grace. And I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. So as we uh, prepare for communion here, just watch your elders on each side for direction, and they will guide you up to the front.
if you could pull out the bread. There are three things in communion that we are doing. We are looking back at the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross. We are celebrating our salvation through Christ as a church family and as united as believers. And we look forward to the return of Christ. In 1 Corinthians 11, 23 through 26, the Apostle Paul says, For I will I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he gave thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's eat the bread together. If you can open up the cup. In the same way, he also took the cup after the supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink of it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Let us drink together. Father, we praise you that you are what unites us together. For you have dwelled forever. The Father with the Son, the Son with the Spirit, three persons in one God united together for eternity and we praise you that we are brought into this life that you had brought into this community this fellowship that you have within yourself you share with us and you invite us to partake and be connected to you Help us to be connected as one body here at Highland, unified, experiencing your life that you have poured out on us in Christ. And I ask this in Jesus' name.